We're proud to have every one of you this morning. Our hope is that this is not just another service. That's our prayer every time we come to church, is that this would not just be common ground, but that you would have a new sense of urgency that I've touched Jesus again today, and that touch is changing my life. Amen. And so don't look for nothing but Jesus Christ. And if you do that, he will be found. If you look for him, he will make himself available. So that's our prayer this morning, that it's not about the building or the speaker or how loud or soft or not about the music or the singing. It's about meeting Jesus. That's the hope of the gospel. If you meet him, everything else comes in to the right priority. Here we are in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 in verse number 1. How many says, I just love to suffer? Not a, not a hand in the congregation. Yeah, that would probably catch all of us. But if you live for God, suffering is part of the business. For as much then as Christ has suffered, has what? Has suffered for us in the flesh. Notice what he said. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath done something. He ceased from sin. Our suffering a lot of times is not what people do to us, but it's what we've did to ourselves. We get hooked on things. We get addicted. I love when you're shouting. In the church I was raised in, there was steel trash cans. Not real great big ones, but about that tall, about that big around the top and then come down. It was not uncommon for people when they left to throw their cigarette lighters or their round can or their chewish tobacco. When they left the church, they left that stuff behind. It was thrown, it was thrown in the trash. It wasn't uncommon. The way I knew it, we, we cleaned the church. I was one of the deacon's sons. And we cleaned the church, and we'd, we'd go into the trash. And as, I mean, for a young kid, you know, 10 or 12 years old, to find... Yeah, and you, you recognize something's happened in that person's life. We didn't know who, who did it, didn't matter. It's just the glory of watching God do a cleanup work in the spirit. And so whenever you, when you throw down what you've been hooked to, your flesh suffers. You're going to have to, yeah. And it's more than physical persecution. The church in America has never known much of that. I mean, if we break a finger now, we think we've been persecuted. And people across the waters are giving their life every day. A, a, young, a young gentleman just for praying was beat to death right in front of his, of his uh, wife and children just recently, just a, a week ago, uh, right there in India. Is that right? Because he, he renounced Muslimism and announced Jesus Christ. And so they caught him praying, beat him to death right there in his house. And we're, we get mad over it. We're still mad. We're mad 10 years later. You know why? We, we're not going to suffer. We're swelled up. You're probably already mad at me right now, ain't you? Please let the wind out and let God in. Yeah. We're, we're kind of airish sometimes. Okay. 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 That's just one verse. I'm not going to preach on that. I just want to. I said, woo. Look at verse number two. They're just 19 verses. Man, that's not very long. Either. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of, but to the, what is God's will in your life and mine this morning? Amen. Woo, that's powerful. Look at verse number three. For the time past of our life may suffice us. This word comes from sufficient. If you've eaten three platefuls, and they offer you some more and you say, what you're saying is sufficient. No. I'm full. No cutting my eyes. I don't want no more. Yeah. So if you can look at your life and say, I've sinned enough. How many would say with me? I have sinned enough. So what you say is, yeah, no. No more. I don't want no more of it. God, somehow help me go around the old nature and let the will of God 
Give me victory. The time passed for life may, success, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we, that's me, your pastor. Yes, I've been way out there, but it's been a long time ago. Woo! I'm sure proud to be saved this morning. Walked in lasciviousness. If you look that word up, it'll beat all the Pharaoh off the stuff you've been looking at. Lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Now, there's nothing wrong with liquor. It's a person drinking it. That's the problem. You hate the whiskey, but that's not the real problem. If you got a sore and you pour whiskey in it and it kills the infection, God's not going to send you to hell for that. It's when you try to drink the whole bottle. <clears throat> Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. <laughs> Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? <clears throat> for for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, spiritually dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God where? In the spirit. <clears throat> but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch under prayer if you know Jesus is coming back and there's something in our deal that says hey let me get over myself long enough to find Christ as my savior and above all things have fervent charity that's love on fire yes. Amen. yeah among yourselves for charity shall cover the multitude of sins I can still like you when you don't shake my hand <laughs> use hospitality one to another without grudging as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So if you've been saved, let other people grow up too. Don't just, yeah. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. So if you've got something to say, read the Bible. <laughs> say, say what? Okay. Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And that word means let it be so. <clears throat> Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Connie and I were just young Christians, and she is mean, <clears throat> and I was real nice. And uh, every time, just before we'd go to church, we'd have a little fuss fight. <clears throat> we had a new baby girl, and we young married, and I'm right. I know I was right. <clears throat> and so, and so the last time this happened, which had happened four or five times since we had moved to Sweetwater and was going to church there, uh, the pastor, when he seen us come in... <laughs> How many can tell when others are swelled up? <laughs> we didn't even want to sit right side by side, but we did because we're supposed to be married. <laughs> and so the pastor, we just barely got set down. The pastor stands up and he says, right in front of the whole church. He said, aren't y'all tired of letting the devil have the victory over your worship time? And you know what happened? The tears started pouring down my face. It's a good thing she cried too. I'd have been mad. <laughs> you know why? Because we were both guilty. If you're guilty, why not just cough it up instead of trying to hide it and being mad when somebody says, I can still see it. <laughs> yeah. You're known and read like an open book. Just because you sit there pious don't mean that something's not going on. You have been identified. <laughs> So when the fiery trial comes, what are you going to do? Thank God that he's done seen the other side of it. And instead of going down, say, Lord, even though they call me up to the front, let me cough it up. I've been ignorant some. I ain't dealt with this correctly. So this time I'm going to take my medicine. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Don't think it's strange when you're suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad. Also with exceeding joy. Daddy would spank us when we was kids. And I mean, we was always getting into something. Randy especially. <clears throat> Daddy had called us in there. He nearly every time he spanked us, he spanked us together. Because he'd let stuff pile up, you know, for like six months. 
And then he'd go down through it. I said, I can't believe this guy's got that much memory on him. I mean, he'd just start off spanking on us, you know, and he's laughing. He'd say, remember when I talked to you about, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> he's working on it. Said, you remember when I talked to you? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you remember when I talked to you? Yeah, I said, let that. <laughs> Boy, we'd take off when he got through spanking us. And no, it, it wasn't capital punishment. It was corporal punishment. And what he was doing was driving the demon out of our life. Yeah. Satan sometimes drags you off the wrong direction. <clears throat> Daddy had a way of bringing us back to our moorings. And when we get through, Dad would come in and we're so happy that he still loved us. He didn't hold it against us. He had to spank us. He loved us too much to leave us like that. He said, come on in here, boy. We'd go in there, you know, we'd be tears still on our face and stuff, and he'd love us up. And, when, and a little bit, we was ready to go. Let's go change the water or catch the horses or go plow, anything. Now, we're, we're, we're grown men now. We can go again. The time I was nine years old, I thought I was grown. <laughs> okay, yeah. So if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. But on your part, he is glorified. So everywhere you go, you're lifting up the name of Jesus. Woo! Yeah, he got a hold of me. He tore me up. I needed it. But man, when he turned me loose, I could say, thank you, Jesus. You love me enough to bring change in my life. Verse number 18. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. Don't steal your tithes <clears throat> or your missions money or your taxes. Oh, man, there's a lot there, isn't there? Uh, he said, that's an evildoer. <laughs> or as a busybody. You better put that phone up for a while. <laughs> In other man's business. Isn't it crazy? I grew up where people talked real nice over the phone. <clears throat> and then they started texting. And they would use language that the way, when I grew up, you would have went and met them somewhere and that would have been, that'd been fixed. Isn't it, isn't it neat how brave people are when they text? Say the coarsest things in the world. Is that God's way for us? No. Just because you can communicate different, you should still be sweet. And say thank you. And please. Yeah. I hadn't got down to the message yet. I just, I just want to talk to you a little bit. I, I mean, I started early where you wouldn't get mad at 12. So. <laughs> yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Remember the first song we sang? I'm not ashamed to testify that he came and saved my soul. But let him glorify God on this behalf. <clears throat> For the time has come that judgment must begin at the honky-tonk. Uh, down there at the hash house. Or where they're selling the wacky weed, marijuana. No, where's it going to start? At the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And friends, this is why we want to reach out to lost people. Because our world needs a Christian example that we can reach out and bring them into the things of the Lord. Verse, seven, verse 18, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Lord, we don't know what to say except thank you for your word. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for hope. And thank you for this precious group of people that's come today. And Lord, what we're asking is that we could spiritually step to the side and you could step up. And you could say to us what needs to be said to this congregation, me and the congregation today. And for these things, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Yeah. I, I thought about several things, and, and maybe, maybe this may be too wild uh, a sermon for you as far as the title. But because of where we're living, <clears throat> the kind of stuff that goes on, and, and where the church is called to, I, I just want to talk to you about this thought. I, I thought about intentional Christianity or give them their money's worth but after I read you my text I want to tell you what the title is this is 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 4 1 Peter 4 verse number 4 
wherein they think it strange that you run not with them. How come you quit running with the world to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you? If you really live for God, you will be a stranger to the world you live in. You may know them, but where you rub shoulders, there's a difference between your life and theirs. Not because you're self-righteous, but because you have actually been born again. If you can still go do the things you did before you got saved, you're still going to the same hell you was before you joined the church. But if, if God has changed your life, you will become, and this is my text, or this is my name of my sermon today, you are a strange cat. You've heard the expression, you see a person that, whoo, that's a strange cat. <laughs> well, the world looks at you. And you know what they say? You are a strange cat. What the world must do, if we have any ability to touch this world, they must know that we are vulnerable. That we are not self-righteous, that we were not born with a holy spoon in our mouth, but we were actually born, like the writer said in Psalms chapter 51, we were shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Nobody is without need of Christ. Nobody. Nobody. If the world can know that, that we're not some holy hypocrite that lives like the devil outside the church and we get in here and sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound and carry our Bible, that there's got to be a difference. And to be the real strange cat that God wants us to be, we must be vulnerable. That we have been lost and the only reason that we're living for God today is because every day we live, we partake of the bread. Our actuality of living for God is because we eat the book. If we don't eat this bread, we don't change. Friends, opinion will never make a Christian out of you. This here is what takes the chisel and knocks the chunks off, like Brother Jake was teaching this morning in the anger class. <clears throat> you need to get the chisel out, knock them chunks off your anger until you can get down to what God said. Be angry, but don't sin. And friends, nothing but God can get you there. If your anger still manipulates your life, you need to be saved. Or you're just born again yesterday. You're 20 years old, still sucking a bottle. There's something broke. <clears throat> Woo! So you're a strange kid if you really live for God. <clears throat> Vulnerability is the opposite of self-righteousness. And the world must know that we have failed ourselves before. If they know that, then there's an open door that, hey, if he's really been lost, God, if he can, God can save him, God can save me. I heard Brother Clinton at one time make a statement. He said, there's not a psychiatrist in the world that wouldn't love to get you on his couch if you're really born again. You know why? Because psychiatrists, their main influence is with the mentally ill And the world looks at you like there's a worm in your brain. <laughs> I love it when you shout. <laughs> yeah, they think that you're so weak, you've got to have a Bible and, and you've built up some, some person that hung on the cross and you're hanging on to something so far off and archaic that that's the only way you can make it. You're just that unhealthy. But friends, you've never known health until you know Jesus as your Savior. Yes. Yes. They want to know why you live for God. They think it's strange that you won't run after them the same way they've been going. Even though you can open up that, yes, I've been wrong, I've been vulnerable, you're still a strange cat to say, I've been saved. I've been born again. Whoever says born again except the Bible? No. The Masons tried to refigure it. The Masonic Lodge, the secret order, they, they say a big, long deal over you and then knock you out. 
And they say when you come back to, yeah, I know some of it. I know a boy's been there. It's not a lie. It's real. They don't want you to know it. They knock you out. And when you wake up, you say, preacher, I'm a Masonic lodge, but you, you need to get saved. You either got to be that or Jesus like. You can't be both. If you're right with God, you lay down the secret order and you pick up the righteousness of Christ and you must say to the world you're living in, I was that, but I ain't that no more. I have become a new creature. The only way they get you fixed is knock you out. When you wake up, they say, now you become a... Don't you love the Lord? Instead of knocking us out, he saves us. Woo! I've been knocked out before, and it didn't change me none. In fact, it made me mad when I woke up. <laughs> okay, I can tell you, you can't stand it, so here we go. <clears throat> They think you're strange because you're born again. They think you're strange because you speak in tongues. It's the Spirit of God gives the utterance. They think you're strange because you're led by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They think you're strange because you pray over your food. They think you're strange because you go to church. Some people do. <clears throat> because you go to church. I was raised. I know my, they thought my daddy was crazy, but we never missed a service. Never. The few times I can count on one hand that we missed church, and that's whenever the wind was blowing, the sand was blowing, and our cotton was about that tall, and Daddy said, the ox is in the ditch, get on them tractors. We'd take three tractors and try to cover our, the, the terrace tops, that's where it would start blowing first, trying to save uh, our uh, living. Because at the end of the year, if you don't have no cotton to strip, you don't have no money in the pocket. And we lived on borrowed money. We borrowed the money to plant, and all buy the fuel and all that. And at the end of the year, we stripped the cotton, we paid our debts, and hoped we had enough to start another year. So, five times, yeah, that's not very many. I, I lived there 18 years. We went to church. It didn't matter if you was crooked or straight. If you lived in my daddy's house, you went to church. If everybody, all the people come to see daddy, guess what? When Sunday morning come, he woke them up, he fed them breakfast, says, you got two choices. You can stay here or go to church. We're going to church. And 90 times out of 100, guess what happened? To church they came. Well, our clothes said, you know what? Your clothes don't mean that much to Jesus. Just get out there and we'll have a great time in the Lord together. Woo! I'm not about strange cats vulnerable. Verse number three says, you've sinned enough. This is vulnerability. This is opening up. Look at, look back here. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable darkness. He said, the past life may suffice us. We have sinned. He just said, we've sinned enough. All of us have. Everyone. I don't care if you're three years old. That's enough. If you can find Jesus, one of our daughters was saved when she was four. Yeah. Who wants to go back to that stuff? There's something better. <clears throat> they got a horse and buggy. Do you want to drive it home or you want to, you want to get in that car with the air conditioner on? <laughs> in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 1, sin is actually forbidden by God. Through the Holy Ghost, as John writes here, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse number 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you do what? That you sin not. He does leave a phrase here. This is not grace saying, go ahead and sin if you want to. This is saying, if you're running so hard, you fall down, knock the knees out of your britches, get up, ask God to forgive you, and go back and live for the Lord. And if you've dirted somebody in the process, ask them to forgive you. Make it right. You do that very many times, you quit going the wrong direction. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So what he's saying, you have the ability through Jesus to keep your life up to date. And that ability is, Lord, I'm sorry, man, get me. Let me get this thing straightened out. I'm going forward. Woo! In the name of Jesus. So vulnerability is one of those things that makes you a strange cat. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 1 <clears throat> Hebrews 2 and 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Why? This is, look, notice the vulnerability listed here. Lest at any time we should let them slip. How many thanks Paul the apostle could have fell off the wagon? Look at his own words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the last verse. Verse number <clears throat> Let me see if I can find it here. Verse number 27. 
1 Corinthians 9, 27. If it's not 27, it is the last verse. Okay, here, it, look, look at this writer. This is Paul the Apostle. He writes not in words. He didn't write over half the New Testament in black and white words, but as far as the books, he wrote almost half of the books that's in the New Testament. Paul the Apostle. And look at this guy. Look what he says. I keep under my body. That's the flesh nature. I bring it into subjection. What is that about? That's that suffering. I'm not going to let my will have its way against the will of God. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What is he saying? I'm vulnerable. And because of that, I stay close enough to God. I stay prayed through to where the devil don't have an inroad into my life to get me down. Even if it's anger, Brother Jake, I ain't going to let anger. I ain't going to let knock me out. I've had some rounds. How many of you have ever had a problem with anger? Oh, if you don't raise your hand, there's a crooked spot in you somewhere. There ain't nobody in this building had had some trouble in anger somewhere. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 12, <clears throat> look at this, look at this scripture. First <clears throat> Corinthians 10, verse number 12. Wherefore let him that in our thinking it's like I'm on the top of the world. But the Lord said, Be careful. Wherefore let him that thinketh he said, take heed lest he fall. And so the strange cat knows he's vulnerable. He recognizes that I, I have failed before. I don't want to go back to that. I know how to go around it. I'm going to do that by the power of God. The second thing in this passage in verse number two is repentance. <clears throat> there are people that think, I repented one time, that's the last time. It's like the guy told his wife, uh, they said at the red light and, and she's over there, way over in the, on that side of the pickup. This is before double cow. She'd have been in the back if it hadn't been for that. But she's way over there on the side and they're sitting at the red light and she look, he looks over at her and there's tears coming down her face. And he says, woman, what's wrong with you? She said, well, you hadn't told me you loved me in five years. He said, well, I told you I loved you when I married you. If I changed my mind, I'll tell you. <laughs> Is that the way you wish your relationship to be? No. Look what he says here. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the, in the flesh of the lust of men, but to what? To the will of God. You are not by yourself in this battle. And so what happens, this is what makes you strange. The second you sin, something happens if you're a real believer. I mean, the very second it goes the wrong direction. What is it? Conviction. What conviction does, conviction says you're wrong. I don't care if you're madder and Pharaoh or you've got a, it's, the, it's not the money, it's the, it's the principle. All that stuff goes through your mind like 400 miles an hour and it's all this stuff. Well, I know I'm not going the right direction, but this, is, this year it's got to be. But some, something happens when you're really close to God and that comes up in your spirit. The second you head the wrong way like that, the Holy Ghost starts convicting you say, that's the wrong spot. The clicker comes on. It's like when you're driving 78 and you go over the top of the hill in a black and white sitting down there. Even though, even though you think you're within the limit, what happens to your leg? <laughs> what? It hits the brake. You know why? Because you're, you're guilty. You know when you said it at seven days, you're just running too fast. <laughs> and so you don't repent. You just don't want to get caught doing it. Real repentance is, Lord, forgive me, and I won't go back. I'm, I'm off of that. You get two or three of them $300 tickets, you're, you do better with your cruise. <laughs> Well, the difference between not repenting and repenting is eternity, the wrong place. And so repentance is, makes us strange because the second we know we've done wrong, we want to go back and get that thing cleared up. That's, that's the spirit of the true believer. It's strange to this world because they say, I'll never forgive you and I'll never forget it. I don't do yakety yak, I get even. Yeah, that, that's the world out there. We've been there. We felt those feelings. <laughs> So I'm sorry needs to be part of my daily life. 
If I know I've dirtied somebody, let me be quick to say, hey, man, I, I miss there. I don't care if it's your own wife or your husband. Thank you, baby. <laughs> she gritted at me. <laughs> if it's your own wife or husband, you need to be quick to say I'm sorry instead of being, you deserve what I give you. There's a crook there. Repentance clears that up and you become what God really wants you to be, that strange person that he's made the call on. No longer should live the rest of his life to the lust of sin. Look at Luke chapter 18, verse 13 and 14. Here's a guy that the Lord could not stand because of the way he acted. This is Luke chapter 18 and verse number 13 and 14. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes. I'm sorry. This is the man he loved. I was thinking about, <laughs> I was thinking about the Pharisee. <laughs> you remember what he did? He said, I'm the one that pays my tithes. I'm not like that dirty guy over yonder, that old rusty publican. I'm not like him. God couldn't stand him. This is the guy he loves. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast saying, God, be merciful to be a sinner. Woo! That repentant heart was tender to God. I mean, the Lord's reaching out to him. Look at verse number 14. <clears throat> I tell you, this man went down to his house. So what does repentance do? It justifies us. Woo! If you repent of it, God forgives you of it. That, that's a strange world, but isn't that the place to go? Whoa! Repent of it, get away from it. So, the publican's posture and his language was so wonderful in the eyes of Jesus when he sees this guy so humble to him. Woo! That's what the Lord's looking for from us. Lord, that we would bow before you. We'd be tender before you. That's what an altar's all about. It's an altar where you come and show your pride and your arrogance and sit down there and like... No, you put that on. Yeah. Hopefully, you throw that man or woman down, out, and you won't pick him back up. The writer in Psalm chapter 51, we won't read it, but I mean those first 10 verses... Uh, Oh, we might read just a little of it. I, I can read fast if you listen fast. <laughs> o other day in our men's meeting, Brother Jake uh, brought this out. Man, it's so powerful. But look, look at this, man. This is true repentance. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy love and kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. So he's owning his lostness. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Friend, anybody that prays that prayer, God's going to forgive you. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. This is between him and God. That's why he calls it personal Savior. Against thee and thee. And listen, he ain't a tattletale either. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desire truth where? In the inward parts and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy of gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. This is a spiritual brokenness that a person feels when he repents. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Anybody that prays that prayer is a strange cat. But that's the way you get to Jesus. Thirdly is sanctification. I'm talking to you about what makes us strange. Vulnerability, repentance, sanctification. One writer said that salvation cleans the inside. It's instantaneous. Can you snap your fingers with me? Ah, that ain't worth a dime. Get it up there and merely make it thump. Yeah. Sanctification, salvation cleans the inside. Sanctification cleanses the outside. The outside man starts looking like Christ. Can you see Jesus vaping just before he preaches? Come on, give me a break, friends. I love what the girl said, I, I cannot remember her name, but they just told me about her sermon. She preached for y'all. Mary Gold Chesser. Yeah. She preached one of the women's meetings. And they asked her after that meeting to speak at a, a Sunday night service in First Assembly in Odessa. And the guy that was there was the presbyter, 
we had a pressure meeting just right after that. And she was talking about the cross and about sin and its nature and how it, how it messes with our mind. And she says, I, I do not understand everything about the cross. All I know about the cross is that that's where the innocent died for the guilty. And then she made this statement. There's never been a day that America didn't know that even smoking is a sin. You know that. You just have to do something about it. It's not the only sin, but sanctification. If you're really born again, sanctification does stuff to you. Immediately, that stuff starts clicking off. I smoked until I got saved. When I got saved, something happened. Sister Nard, I could not, I couldn't smoke no more. I took a whole pack of Marlboros going down the road and throw them out the window. I couldn't drink no more. I, I chewed uh, red tag tensely, and if it wasn't red tag, I, I chewed white tag. That's better because it's not quite as dirty. But And I dipped Copenhagen. I, I'm just telling you that something happens when you get saved, sanctification, the outside stuff begins to disintegrate. It has no meaning. The round can print on my W's on the back of my britches is gone. It ain't going to be there no more. I'm a free man by the grace of God. I'm just telling you, you get saved, something happens. The sanctification starts peeling that outside. The language, instead of that coarse, uh, filthy, is that the right word? Yeah. The coarse, filthy language, it goes away. You can't say praise God and cuss like a demon and expect to go to heaven, friends. There's, sanctification clears that out of your system. You, you don't even use harsh language against, I mean, even though it's not cursing, you know, people can tell when you don't like them. <laughs> okay, yeah. And so, sanctification cleans up the outside that separates us from it and we, it separates us from sin and dedicates us to God in verse number 7 here's the scripture in our text First, uh, First Peter chapter 4 verse number 7 but the end of all things is at, at hand so what are we going to do be you therefore sober when you get saved sanctification steps right up and said you're too sober to go back to that you know that the blood of Jesus died to cleanse you, not to leave you where you was. Now, I, I want to say this in the process. There are people that never smoked a cigarette, that never vaped, that never dipped no snuff, that never chewed any tobacco, that never drank no alcohol, that still will not go to heaven because they must be saved. Amen. Salvation, that's just some of the stuff that fell off of my life. And I can look at y'all, I'll promise you, there was stuff you had that had to go. It's got to go. It can't stay there. It may be bitterness or anger or, I mean, all that stuff, it just falls off of your life. We don't have time to read it. Well, we might just say, Benz, it don't matter. 12, don't matter. <clears throat> look, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11. <clears throat> Just before, in verses 9 and 10, it talks about the horrible things that we have done as humans. It dictates our sin. And then notice what happens when you get to Jesus. And such were some of you. But ye are washed. And notice this next word. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Woo, it's so wonderful to get cleaned up. You can't tell a filthy joke. You won't listen to one. Amen. Amen. That stuff goes from you. I can't go down that road. I don't want to be a part of it. There's got to be a difference. So the writer says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that sanctification is actually the will of God because he wants our testimony so pure that we don't look like the same thug we was before we come to Jesus. I love it when you shout now. You never thought about yourself being, okay. For this is the will of God. How can we go around sanctification? You say, I don't even know what it means. Well, get a, get a lie at it. He's going to give us some input. This is the will of God. Who would not want to be in the will of God? Did you know it's a proven fact that the safest place on the planet is in the will of God? Amen. Amen. So you lay down that old stuff. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you, oh, okay, I'll get it right, that ye should abstain from fornication. Look at verse number four. That every one of you 
the preacher included, of course, should know how to possess his vessel how? In sanctification and honor. So you run up against these old things that's been eaten on you, but you've got some know-how. I know how to get around that now. Yeah, I love what Brother Clinton said. He said he smoked like a freight train until he got saved. He was like 40 years old. He was a Marine, and he made his mind up. He said this is his words to the Lord when he got saved. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to quit smoking, but I made my mind up that I'll be craving one of them the rest of my life before I'll ever smoke another and bring shame to you. And he said it wasn't very many days until the want to was gone. Friends, here's the power of God dealing with those things, those trespasses in our life that says there's a way to get away from it. There's a power that transcends the trouble. You may just be hooked on TV. Uh, it's probably the world turns or something like that. And you just can't live without it. Is it that important? Is it taking that much time? You don't have no prayer time, no Bible study time, but you've got TV time. The TV, it's not the problem with the TV. The problem is the person that's hooked to it. Yeah. It's a, there's some stuff on there It's okay probably. But if it, if it takes so much of your time, you don't, can't get to church on Sunday night, something's broke. Yeah, my body said I'll be here. I'm so sanctified. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo! Second Corinthians 6 and 17. Aren't you proud? I just got four points. I've done nearly through the third one. In 2 Corinthians 6 and 17, he says, do something. This is what you do. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the assemblies of God. I am so thankful that the assemblies didn't say that. I am proud that they believe the Bible. And the Bible says that the Lord, that the Lord Jehovah said, come out from among them and be the strange cat you're supposed to be. Woo! Say the Lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Ephesians 5 and verse number 11. <clears throat> you quit hanging around that old stuff because it don't belong to you anymore. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather Reprove them. I was a TV freak when I got saved. I knew that. I had some other bad problems too. But I'd come home instead of talking to Connie, I'd just sit down there. I'm tired. I've been working 12 hours, 10 hours, whatever. I'd sit down there. I wanted her to bring me some supper. That's what women's supposed to do, is take care of the husband. Her eyes are going, <laughs> well, you're supposed to eat, aren't you? <laughs> She, she was a wonderful wife. He is a wonderful wife. Anyway, she'd bring my supper over there, but there was no fellowship. I mean, when I got through eating, watched a little TV, I'd go to bed. It wasn't the bad, it wasn't the bad stuff then. I mean, you know, like uh, Rifleman or uh, sometimes Gunsmoke or, uh, see, uh, yeah, there's some other stuff. I don't remember. Maybe, I don't know. Clint Eastwood and Gil Faber, whatever their deal with Rawhide, yeah. <clears throat> That was before they went crazy, you know. But anyway, uh, when I got saved, I said, Lord, something's got to, I got to do something with me. I got to get a handle on this because if I sit down, my eyes just glued. I can't get away from it. And what I wanted to be glued to was this. And that was my spiritual man, but my physical man said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so we took our TV and we throwed it outside until our kids was way up in years before we ever got one. And when we did, then we, we had a little better control ourselves. We could lead them in how the TV is not bad if you just don't let it destroy you. There's some stuff it's okay. I mean, you know, you don't need 20 hours of it, one shot. But yeah. I'm talking about sanctification. Something happens when you get right with God. He washes that stuff out of your system. Whoa. And then the third one is the righteousness of Christ in verse number 16. So here's what we've talked about. The strange cat is this cat that's vulnerable. Is this cat that repents whenever he does something wrong. And this person, this cat that looks his life over and says, some of that stuff just can't stay with me. I cannot live like I used to live. God has called me to a higher call. He called me to be like him, not be like 
the devil. And so what that brings us to is the actual righteousness of Christ in verse number 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this matter. Friends, if people know enough about you to know that you're a believer, you're, you're hitting the ball out of the park. If all they know is what you told them, that's different. But if your life outside when you're changing a flat, if you're still a Christian, when the, when the pecan pie balls over in the oven and you smell the burn all through the house and you're still a Christian, when you're offered an opportunity for a $5 bet to make a million dollars with a scratch off and you turn it down. I'm just trying to talk to you in the real world. When you get the righteousness of Christ, friends, the world has no bearing over your life. Amen. You've become something. That's what he said he wanted us to be. That Jesus was actually crucified for our sins that we could become the righteousness of Christ through him. That's the hope he gives us. So it says here, if you suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf that I got by it. That's where my failure was, my lostness. I got by it in the name of Jesus. And so we're looking at just a few scriptures. This is Galatians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. I know, I know it's four minutes after 12. I got one. Look here. <clears throat> what is that? What is that in the light of eternity? Here in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse number 15 and 16. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. He's looking at the Galatian church like the Texas churches. And he said, there was a time you were so sold out on God. You would have pulled your eye out and gave it to me. He said, something's happened. And this is when you get away from the righteousness of Christ. Look at this next verse. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. If, if we could stop the people that left this church, half a Snyder would be here today. Amen. But when you say what the Bible says, all of a sudden, it's not because we hate you, we love you. But we want you to go to heaven. If you go here, that's my heartbeat. That's a heartbeat of our Sunday school teachers. That's a heartbeat of the school of Christ. That's a heartbeat of our Wednesday night services. Is that you would get to heaven over your own problem. Amen. And me, get to heaven over mine. Yes. Woo! If we can get there, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. So, whoo, am I your enemy because I'm telling you what the Bible says? Is that where to make your enemies? If you want to hate somebody, hate the devil. Amen. Hate the way of hypocrisy. Yes. Hate lostness. Yes. Love people. Yes. Love God. Be the strange cat that prays for who that becomes the righteousness of Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 15 Romans chapter 1, verse 15, 16, and 17. That's not very long reading, is it? Ah, so as much as in me is. Have you flexed your spiritual muscles lately? These little guys are always coming to Brother Danny. <laughs> I mean, they got something about as big as a popcorn. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to flex your spiritual muscles and say, God, by your grace, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And by the way, that was the devil's habitat. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to us Greeks, or Gentiles. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. How is it revealed? From faith to faith, from Sunday night to Wednesday night. If it's real, it's still good then. From Wednesday night to Sunday morning, from prayer time. Yeah, it's there. There is the rush of God revealed how. From faith to faith that is written, the just shall go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah. By faith, you live for God every day you live. You're not throwing it down no time. Every day is our day with Christ. First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12 and 13. There's two more scriptures I'm closing. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I'm talking about the righteousness of Christ. That's what we become. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I'm talking about a man that's been changed and he's been changed because of the pressure of the gospel on his life. First, first Peter 1, 17, 18, and 19. And this is the last I'm going to read to you unless the Holy Ghost changes my mind. Oh, ho, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's going to take more than shaking the preacher's hand and calling some denominal church group to be saved. You must be born again and you must become this strange cat that's found Christ as their Savior, vulnerable, repentant, sanctified, and have become the righteousness of Christ. Could we stand together? With heads bowed, and some of our folks are going to come and just tenderly play here on the piano. The last song we sang was not a muscle song. It was not just about the music, and I love, I love the music. It's all through the Bible about music. But it talked about the amazing grace of God. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus, you know that you have not lived for God. You're not a Christian today. We beg you to come to grips with your walk and make yourself available to Christ. He loves you. And if you'll just raise your hand, we'll pray for you. And then we'll meet you at an altar of prayer and believe God with you to forever shatter this old way to become the new person that God wants you to be. How many this morning with an uplifted hand would say, Pastor, here's one already. I need the prayers of this church in my life. I want to make sure that what I've did is for Jesus. Anybody else? Well, here's another one right here. Anybody else? Pastor, I would love to make sure that my walk with Christ is like it should be. And I want, I want prayer this morning. Anyone else this morning? There's another one right there. Thank you for being so tender. Right there's another one. Thank you. We're going to have prayer here in just a few moments. What about in your life? Why hide today when Jesus so openly loves us and is bidding us to come to him? It's not about me, friends. This is about your walk with Christ. Anybody else in this building? Pastor, I know that some of the stuff I've lived like, I need God in my life this morning fresh. And by uplifted hand, I'm asking for prayers from this church group. Okay, I want us to pray together. Father, here, here's several already. There's two more hands raised right here. We're asking you, Lord, that as we get ready to take the next step and come around these altars, that you would meet these precious loved ones right where they are standing right now. And Lord, just like you forgave me and you've forgiven so many in this room. And Lord, maybe these loved ones have even made their way to Christ before, but they just sense that they want a closer walk. Lord, would you touch today like only you're able to touch in the name of Jesus Christ who spilled his blood for our sins. Please forgive as repentance is spoken over these lies. We thank you for it now in the name of Jesus. Just before you come to the altar, how many would say, Pastor, I would like my life to be lived in such a way that they could recognize me as a strange cat. That's going to be me. These altars are open. Would you come this morning and let Jesus uh, specially do a work in your spirit one more time. He comes to separate us from lostness.